Welcome to the life you're made for with me, Dr. Heather Penny. We're going to be having conversations to talk about us spiraling up versus spiraling down because we all want to be living lives that are about thriving, not just surviving. This is the life you're made for. So let's get going. Oh, hello, Jim. It's so good to see you again. Heather, great to see you. Great to be here. Yes, we had a great conversation a couple of weeks ago on your podcast. And at the end, I said, I want you on my podcast. So yep, here we are. Here we are. Listeners, you're in for a treat today. Jim is a pod, a performance coach. And Jim, I'm going to let you tell you, tell our listeners a little bit more about you. But what I love about you and why I wanted to bring you on my show was that your emphasis on really the value of failure. <laughs> so we're going to talk sure. a little bit more about that before we jump in. Why don't you tell our listeners, listeners a little bit of who you are? Sure. Uh, my name is Jim Harshaw. I am the president of the Harshaw Group a personal performance coaching and leadership development firm. Uh, my background is in sport. So wrestling was my sport. I was an NCAA Division I All-American wrestler. Uh, I was a Division I head coach. Uh, I was actually the youngest Division I head wrestling coach in the country at one point. So that's really where the, the framework of success through failure comes in, in my my coaching framework. And um, so that's a little bit about me professionally, personally. Um, I am a uh, father of four and live in Charlottesville, Virginia. Oh, I love it. Yeah, we got to throw in those families things too, because I've been married. We're going on 30 years this wow. year. We're super excited. I know. Yeah, and I got congratulations. We have we have number 20 coming up this summer. Oh, congratulations. And four kids. Yeah. yeah. And I've yeah. I've got both my kids successfully launched. So my husband and I keep joking. Thanks. You're welcome, world. We did our job. Yeah. <laughs> We've done our job. Wash your hands. Of it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the name of your podcast again, Jim? Success through failure. Success through failure. So uh, listeners, I wanted to highlight that for you because we will announce to you when my show is dropped and when it's published. And I think you'll really enjoy that. But the reason I'm bringing it up, Jim, is because I volunteered some of my own epic failures. So you know I'm going to return the the favor to you. (laughs) Tell tell us a little bit of not only why you fail, but give us an idea of, of when you failed, what did you learn from it? And really the value of that. And again, as you've taught it to your kids, but give us some of your own personal background on, on some of your own fails. Sure. Sure. So I gave a TEDx talk years ago called why I teach my children to fail. And Mm. it was largely about my wrestling career, which was mostly failure. I mean, I failed Mm. to reach my goals in high school. I failed to reach my goals in college up until my senior year. And I finally got onto the podium at the national championships. I had to wrestle the match. It was the big match was, you know, seven minute match in front of 15,000 people in in my whole career kind of on the line. And and I won that match and became an all American Mm. and Olympic hopeful and being ranked on the Olympic level in the United States. And, and so, um, in sport, we understand the value of failure and we understand that this, 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 you know, this, these sporting events that are played out in front of us on the big stage, we understand that, you know, failure can lead to success. Uh, failure is part of success. You know, when you look at somebody who's the greatest of all time at what they did, Tom Brady, you know, he, he had a half a dozen games where he threw at least four interceptions. I mean, failure is part of sports. And it was part of my life as, as a wrestler. And it was because of those, not despite those, but because of those that I was eventually able to, to finally find success. Um, but then I got into the real world and I got into uh, coaching and I coached for about 10 years and college coaching. And then I got out of coaching, started my first business and that was successful. And I started my next business, raised angel capital, started a technology company and that failed. And that failure left me again at this low point where I had experienced a lot of low points in my wrestling career, not the least of which it was at the end of my junior year. Mm-hmm. And, and I, you know, thought I was going to finally achieve and finally get onto the podium, finally achieve one of my goals. And, and I didn't, but I, I found myself in the locker room in tears, wondering like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? You know, am I not good enough? Am I not smart enough? Am I not capable enough? Like, is this, is this just not in the cards for me? But It was, you know, going one more step, getting up one more time every time, which finally got me uh, onto the podium and finally creating uh, a level of success that I had not yet to that point been able to reach. But, Mm. you know, you fast forward into the real world and here I am with a failed business, feeling those same feelings, feeling the the self-doubt, the, you know, am I not good enough? Am I not smart enough? Am I not Mm -hmm. capable enough? And except for now in the real world, 
as your listeners know, and, and you know, Heather, of course, mm-hmm. is that these failures, there, there's, there's more at stake than, mm-hmm. than winning a sporting event. It mm-hmm. was, you know, my, my livelihood and, and my mm-hmm. family and my relationship with my wife and my kids. And, you know, I, I was in such mm-hmm. a mess at that point where I was so single-minded focused on mm-hmm. my business that I had kind of, you know, s- stopped paying attention to everything else in my life. I was mm-hmm. so intent on growing this business and, and had that single-minded focus, like, like, I had as an athlete, well, that doesn't Mm. really work in the real world because I wasn't spending enough time with my wife and we had a struggling relationship. I wasn't Mm. spending enough time with my kids. I wasn't working out. I wasn't healthy Mm. and fit. I was in the worst physical shape of my life. And we had debt up to our eyeballs. I was broken, broken. And, and I remember there was a night, Heather, when I was, when I was shutting down that business and I was was Mm. starting to look for jobs. And I was actually on Craigslist. I guess people used to post jobs on Craigslist and I'm like scrolling on Craigslist one night, <laughs> yeah. looking for looking at jobs and I'm scrolling past jobs for like paper boys and unpaid internships. And I'm thinking to myself, like, how did I end up here? I've got yeah. two degrees from the number one public university in the country. I was a mm-hmm. division one, all American. And everybody talks about how, you know, when you have these great degrees and, mm-hmm. and you know, when you're, you're an athlete, you learn all these great life lessons. I'm like, gosh, well, I either missed it uh, or if I didn't, I, I needed to dig those up and figure out what those are. And, yeah. and I remember closing down my computer after looking for jobs there. And I set my computer aside and I walked mm-hmm. upstairs and I laid down next to my wife and I'm staring at the ceiling. She was already asleep. And I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, like, what was in place in my life when I went from underperformer to peak mm-hmm. performer as a wrestler and dealt with failures, managed through failures and was mm-hmm. able to get up one more time every time and, and go through incredible Pain, to be honest, pain and suffering. That's mm-hmm. what wrestling is. Wrestling is one yeah. of those sports where you go through a lot of pain and it's not easy. <laughs> it's not a game. You don't play. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, but it's, it's, there, there's a lot of, a lot of struggle that goes into that. Mm-hmm. And I said, what was in place in my life then that allowed me mm-hmm. to persevere through, through low points and have a clear vision from my life and move through failure and find success on the other side. And I realized there was this framework in place and I started putting these things back in place in my life. And, and it transformed everything for me. I realized, wow. you know, I, I started getting clear on my goals again and, and, and having a, a passion and a vision for my life. And, and I was able to get up and, and, you know, I transformed everything in my life. I healed my marriage. I started spending more time with my kids. I tripled my income. I got healthy and fit mm. again. It was, it all, all these things came back into place and, and I realized like, this wasn't just a, a gym thing. This wasn't, this framework wasn't just something that, that worked for me. I looked at, you know, a friend of mine, look at his life. He's an Olympic gold medalist in 2000 mm-hmm. and his name's Brandon Slay and the same framework is in place in his life. And I have friends who have gone into special forces and the same mm-hmm. framework is in place in their lives. And, you know, on my podcast and 400 plus episodes now, I've interviewed CEOs and, you know, Navy SEALs and New York Times bestselling authors, and it's the same framework. So, mm. so it is that, that framework that got me through those failures as an athlete and in the real world. And so, yeah, some, you know, it's easy for me to share these stories very quickly here on a podcast episode, but you know, yeah. there were real tears in, when sure. I lost as a wrestler, sure. there were, uh, there when and kept falling short over and over and over. And there were yeah. real tears that, that were, you know, when I had a failed business and a struggling marriage and, you know, just, mm-hmm. you know, broke and broken at that point. I mean, this was, these were some really dark times for me. Wow. That's powerful. Thank you for sharing that. I've got several thoughts going on, but the first one that's hitting me is, you know, I've talked about three C living, clarity, confidence, and courage. And I coach people in that. And one of the things I really heard you say, and that I attach this to getting clarity of what is true here, we have to ask better questions. So as you were lying in bed, the question shifted from what's wrong with me and uh, why, why am I such a failure? I mean, those are not helpful questions to shift it over into what was the framework for how I succeeded when I did succeed. That is just that's what hit me as you were talking. I'm like, first of all, well done, Jim. But I wanted mm. to highlight that for our listeners to say, we've all been there. We all can ask these questions. And I'm just going to call it, they're horrible questions. They're mean to ourselves. They just make us feel terrible and worthless. And we wouldn't ask them to anyone else, but we ask them to ourselves. And for you to be able to shift that question, how powerful, you had the answers within you. You just yeah. asked a better question. Right. And you talk about that in your book, like the yes. the power of the questions that you ask yes. yourself, 
leads you to clarity, confidence, and courage, right? These right. are the questions that you guide your clients to yeah. by asking them questions. And so often, like you said, those answers are inside of us. We just mm -hmm. need somebody like you or like me out yeah. Uh, outside of not in the weeds with you and not in your head right. to ask you those hard questions. And luckily I was able to do that for myself a little bit. And, and you know, everybody, we can do a little bit of self-coaching. There's, you know, there's mm -hmm. journaling and asking yourself those questions and that sort of thing. But we really need somebody like mm -hmm. you, what you do for your clients. We need somebody outside of us who's yeah. asking us the hard questions and forcing us to answer those. And, and I, I, I think you and I may have talked about this when you were on my podcast, but I've identified sort of over the years, looking at all the the folks who I've had on the podcast mm -hmm. and, and like, there's one theme, there's one habit that they all do that, that has really been the leverage for their success. Mm -hmm. And I, I would always ask guests for a long time until I started getting the same answers over and over. I would say, what is the one habit you most credit for your success? And, you know, for the New York Times bestselling author, you think it would be some kind of writing habit. For the Olympic gold medalist, you think it would be some kind of training habit. But it's never the thing that they're known for. It's always some version of asking questions, whether it's through mm. journaling or working with a mentor, working with a coach or mm -hmm. taking a retreat or going on a retreat. It's always these or, or even just like as simple as like planning my day in advance or mm -hmm. at the end of the week, reviewing mm -hmm. my week and looking mm -hmm. at what worked, what didn't work in the, mm -hmm. in the military, they call it an after action review. Mm -hmm. And, and so I've identified this concept, this theme in, in, in you know, exactly the same thing that, that you've identified, Heather is mm -hmm. these questions. And I, so I, we call it the productive pause, the productive pause. Mm. And it's the productive pause is defined as this. It's a short period of focused reflection mm. around specific questions that leads to clarity of action and peace of mind, clarity oh, of action and peace of mind. And that's what, yes. that's what we want. That's your yes. three C's, right? Yeah, totally. And mm -hmm. that is the secret for the listeners. Think about the questions that you need to ask yourself mm -hmm. or better yet, find somebody like Heather who can ask them to you mm -hmm. and help you get outside of your own head and find the clarity, confidence, and courage that you're looking for. Oh, I'd love that. That productive pause. I love that definition, you know, and I call that uh, time under the stars with my allegory, but right. it's that really taking a beat. And I'll say this often to clients, pull back in order to do more, <laughs> do less in order to do more. It feels counterintuitive. And I think this is why you and I resonated so much when you want to be successful in life. The, the worst thing you could do is say, I've got to white knuckle it. I've got to push. I've got to push. I've got to push. And we're asking really a terrible question. How do I be successful? How do I be successful? How do I, how do I succeed at all costs to be able to pull back and say, wait a minute, what is success? And you mentioned it, wait, it's multifaceted. I'd like to keep my marriage. <laughs> I'd like yeah. to have a great relationship with my kids. Right. I'd like to bring in a revenue that could support my, my uh, family. Wait a minute, this Maybe my my definition for this business was way too narrow of a definition for success, and it was pulling me off course. So being able to pull back and say, I'm going to ask really a better question to get my clarity around where do I want to be successful and how multifaceted is it? Because maybe I got missile lock on one area and it began to cost me the areas that I really wanted to be successful in. And I think that's the good news we get to tell people. I'm like, you get to be successful in all the areas you want to be successful in. You just got to have the clarity on how you're prioritizing that to make sure that they're harmoniously fitting together versus competing with one another. Absolutely. And, you know, like you said, we want to just white knuckle it and bear it down and we'll work <laughs> harder. We'll burn more midnight oil. And it's like, yeah, wait a second. There's a better way to go about this. Um, I interviewed um, Gregory McEwen, who is the author of Essentialism and Effortless, a couple of oh. both New York Times bestsellers. And this concept of effortless, like we don't mm. have to white knuckle it. We don't, it, you know, working harder is not going to get you from where you're at to where you want to go. Sure. Yes. We all know you have to work hard. That's, that's, that's table stakes. And, right. you know, there, there's leverage, there are leveraged ways to, to use your time. I mean, there are, pl I mean, there are plenty of work people yeah. in, in the world who work very, very hard that mm -hmm. don't, make much money or don't, or aren't, aren't very healthy or aren't, aren't, you know, don't have healthy relationships. Like it's not, it's not just hard work. Right. Right. I love that. That's the right way to do it. I want to get real practical on this. So if mm -hmm. you're working with someone and I work with a ton of high achievers where I jokingly say, I, 
it feels like they just whip open their car door going 80 miles per hour yelling, jump in, Heather, jump in. And I'm like, I have to be equally strong and say, I will not jump in. You will pull over your car and then we can chat because that's only going to drive us both crazy. And I seriously will not be serving you. So it's to your point of the productive pause. But what would you tell our listeners who have never heard this idea of productively pausing to ask better questions. And again, I use like even the metaphor of pull over your car and get out a map. <laughs> and let's start looking at where you want to go. Get out your old fashioned folding map. Don't just punch in the GPS coordinates. Really look at the map. What would you say to these people that are saying, I'm not sure I trust the productive pause. I'm not sure it's going to get me where I'm going. In fact, I'm afraid, and this is what I call the false beliefs, it's going to leave me further behind the pack or I'm going to actually fail worse if I pause. What would you say to those people? Yes, I would say this. So so I, I talked about this framework earlier. Yeah. And, and so let, let me share the, the four steps to this framework, because once you understand this, you go, ah, okay, that makes sense. Once I put that in place in my life, mm-hmm. now I can work more efficiently, more effectively, work smarter, not harder, all those things. Be- because listen, uh, I was I was the guy as a wrestler who showed up early, stayed late. I, I, for for my entire career, I was voted the hardest worker on my wrestling team at, at mm. University of Virginia. Wow! But that didn't get me onto the podium. That's not mm-hmm. what got me there. Like it was it was a shift in in mindset and working smarter, not harder. And so it, we've all heard that. So what is that? What does that mean? So so when you're an athlete, we we know this about athletics, right? Because with this is, again, this is played out in front of us. I had a clear vision for what success looked like. I knew exactly what it looked like. Mm-hmm. It, there's no ambiguity. Mm-hmm. In the real world, there is. In the real world, like what does success look like? Have you actually stopped to identify mm-hmm. what success looks like for you in all of the areas of your life? And we focus on on four relationships, self, health, and wealth. Wealth being wealth, work, career, finance. But if you actually define what Mm. success looks like, and once you do that, you can then identify your core values. And Mm. again, nothing new. We've we've heard this before, but what most people do to identify their core values is they go to a conference, someone hands them a sheet of paper that has like 200 words on it. And they say, you know, circle the 20 words that resonate with you. Okay. Cut it down to 10. Okay. Cut it down to five. Those are your core values. And and nobody remembers 24 hours later what their core values are. You have <laughs> yeah. to do the deep, meaningful yeah. work to truly yeah. understand. Like my clients, if you walked up to any of them on the street right now, this moment, you'd say, what are your core values? Every single one of them could tell them, tell you right off the top of their head, these are my core values. And they know that they've done the work to identify those and those are meaningful for them. So that's mm-hmm. number one is the vision and values. Mm-hmm. Actually, like actually doing it, not just going, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let me go after this episode. Let me just go back and, and start checking email and get bogged into the minutia again. You know, get back mm-hmm. into the car going 80 miles an hour. No, you have to do that. So that's number one. Number two, you create goals that align with mm-hmm. those values. Goals that are in harmony with those values, mm-hmm. not goals that align with uh, uh, what you see on social media, not goals that align with what you see in the mass media or your parents raised you to want, or don't align your goals based on what's parked in your neighbor's Mm -hmm. driveway, base your goals upon what is important to you, your vision and your values. Mm. And, and then you have to create what we call micro goals. All right. That's, that's, we're not going to go into the weeds there so much, but like, that is the, the, the monthly goals. Like, what am I doing this month Mm. to move towards this larger goal? Like we identify the specific action items, the, the KPIs, if you will, mm-hmm. and, and then we track those and we mm-hmm. score those month to month. How did you do? You know, success, some success, failed, and then learn from those and then identify the next ones mm-hmm. for the next month. So you have to have a tracking, a planning system there. Mm-hmm. And then, so that's the second piece of the four-part framework. So first is the vision and values. Mm-hmm. Second is aligned goals. The third is the environment of excellence. Mm-hmm. And again, using the athletic metaphor, this is my background, this is where I come from. When I was wrestling, I had I had a coach who kicked me in the ass if I needed a kick mm-hmm. or or helped me course correct if I needed mm-hmm. that. Um, they they saw they saw my blind spots and helped me mm-hmm. see my blind spots. They asked me the hard questions. So as a coach, I also had teammates. I was around other people who were doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. And you know, if I was around, I don't know, I didn't belong to a fraternity, and nothing wrong with fraternities. But if I was part of a fraternity, I'd probably been partying a lot more. And mm-hmm. that's not that. Well, that would have maybe brought, you know, networking and other kind of connection. That would have been great then. 
I needed my environment of excellence. Sure. I needed to be around like-minded people mm -hmm. striving for similar goals. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely critical. And if you are in your own head or or hanging or around people who are you know, average or mediocre and you don't want to be average or mediocre, mm -hmm. you can't hang around the same people, right? There's mm -hmm. the, the quote that we've all heard a million times is you are the average of the five people you spend the most time mm -hmm. with. I mean, we all say it, but do we actually do it? Do we actually go, you know what? Um, I need to probably spend more time with that person, right? There's an mm -hmm. entrepreneur in town in Charlottesville here who I love spending time with. I actually literally, we're, we're, we're not like really that close, but every once in a while I, I text him, I'm like, hey man, let's get together, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we get together and I yeah. brainstorm and he's just amazing. He just thinks it's such such a higher level than I do. Mm -hmm. I, I need that in my life. I know I mm -hmm. need that in my life. And so I bring that actively into my life in the in the health and fitness side, like I, I, my neighbor, I hate running with my neighbor. I run every, I ran this morning with my neighbor and I hate running with him. He runs way faster than he's just crushes me. Every time we run, I'm like, he's dragging me along, but he's part of my environment of excellence. I know that I need yes. that. I need that. So I welcome that accountability, that, mm. that environment. And that, so that's the third piece. And then the fourth and final piece of the framework is while all of this is well and good, you have mm -hmm. a vision and values, you have aligned goals, you have this environment of excellence, you have to have a plan to actually follow through. Because when I was wrestling, you know, injuries happened. Uh, I, I might have a, a big paper due with, uh, or a test the mm -hmm. same day as a big match. Like mm -hmm. nobody cares. You still have to have a plan to follow through because in the real world, again, the stakes are higher and, and the things that can mm -hmm. go wrong are even bigger, you know? Kids get sick, cars break down, uh, mm -hmm. global pandemics happen. I mean, you still have to have that plan to follow through. Like if I lost a wrestling match on a mm -hmm. on a Friday night and I'm sitting in the corner feeling sorry for myself, coach doesn't care. He's like, hey, Jim, come mm -hmm. on. Uh, uh, I'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. in the weight room. Be there. Mm -hmm. Like whether you like it or not, mm -hmm. be there. Mm -hmm. Like there's this infrastructure. There's this plan for long-term follow through. And, you know, and people in the people and men and women of the military, like they get this framework too, this infrastructure, this discipline that helps them perform at their best to maximize their potential. So that when you build this framework into your life, failure is 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 not irrelevant. I don't want to downplay the pain and in, in, in you know self-doubt that comes from failure. It is real. Mm -hmm. But when when you fail at something, it doesn't change what you value. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change what's important to you. And, and if you have this infrastructure and these goals that are actually tethered to your values, not tethered to, again, what's parked in your neighbor's driveway, then you're able to get it up. You're able to be resilient. You're able to manage through failure and come out the other side being even more successful, even more wise, even more experienced, and even better off. I love that. I love that. And I'd like to even build on that. Uh, thanks. Thank you for sharing that score with the framework. I wrote them all down. I thought those are great. And I appreciate yeah. you just sharing that wealth of knowledge with our listeners, because I do think framework is everything. And if you have your framework, it allows you to step into that. One of the things I'd like to even just connect it to, though, is part of my framework is what did I learn about myself with this failure? That is so important for me in order to, to uh, refine my framework and to understand that who I am more so that I can take that next step forward. So I think that's the question I want to ask you. What did you learn from that failed business about yourself that contributed to an even stronger framework in the future? There, there were a lot of things that I learned. So um, first of all, it was it was this epiphany of like, oh my gosh. I'm not operating with the same infrastructure, the same framework. So I literally discovered mm. that framework. Like when I teach this framework, I tell people like, I didn't invent this. I didn't create this out of thin air. Like this was a thing that I experienced before. I didn't know, you know, you lived most it out. athletes. Yeah. And I lived yeah. it out and I yeah. saw it and I can look back and go, ah, okay, let me try this again in the real world. Ah, yes, it works. Oh, look at all these other world-class performers. Right. It's the same thing. So, so that was a, that was the biggest 
learning for me out of that. And then, you know, I mean, gosh, I mean, I can go into detail on, on, on sort of, you know, I didn't raise enough angel capital because to be honest, my vision wasn't big enough. Mm -hmm. Um, there were all kinds of mistakes that I made in, in design, in, in doing the first design of mm -hmm. this, this technology framework. Um, and, you know, going back and I really, it would do it all totally different. Like there's so much learning yeah. that, that took place. I mean, I could give you 10 other lessons. Um, and, and that's just in the business side. I mean, gosh, in the, right. in the personal relationship side and my health and wellness and all of that, like mm -hmm. there's so many learnings that happened. And so I interviewed Tim Ferriss on my podcast and mm -hmm. maybe a lot of your listeners probably have heard his name. At least he's a five time, you know, New York times bestselling author and has a huge podcast himself. And he, he, he said something that was really poignant. It was really interesting. He said, he said, there's a, there are a lot of people who go through failure their whole lives and they mm -hmm. never learn from it. Like failure in and of itself will not create success. It's the learning that comes from yes. failure. Yep. That that's creates. what I was getting at. Yep. That's, that's exactly what you were getting at. It's exactly it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's learning. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's working with a coach or asking mm -hmm. the hard questions yeah. that go, they help you go, ah, okay. I see where I went wrong. I see next time I can do it a little bit differently. And that's where the magic happens. Listen, failure sucks. Mm -hmm. It hurts. No one's saying you should walk through failure and with a big smile on your face or go out and <laughs> seek failure. We're yeah. not talking about that. We're saying, no. okay, listen, it yes. hurts. Um, it, it, it creates mm -hmm. the self-doubt and maybe the fear of trying again. But when you evaluate it and, yep. and, and work with a coach, mm -hmm. then you can actually benefit from it. Oh, so well said. It makes me think of an of another fail. I'm not sure I shared this one on your show, but I'll share it now. I bought a yeah. coffee shop probably about with my husband and I, I don't know, about 15 years ago. And we were kind of dappling into the entrepreneurial world. You know, I, we were both working in corporate America and we we're kind of like, I think we're tired of climbing that ladder. Let's do it. So let's buy this coffee shop and what could go wrong? You know, <laughs> well, a lot went wrong. <laughs> Yeah. And after a year and a half, all we were trying to figure out is how do we flip this and get out? Like, this is not us. And I remember one of these hard moments, my husband and I were lying in bed. All the epiphanies happen when we're lying in bed, isn't it? Sure, right. <laughs> and he's like, I did not go to college for this. And I go, me neither. You know, and that was like yeah. all we could kind of eke out. There was this awareness of this isn't who we're made to be or do. We could make it work. We could be successful, but this isn't what we want. After we flipped it and got out and kind of got over the, what was that all about? <laughs> I'm telling you, that learning lesson was so profound for me. Mm -hmm. I learned some basic things of, I will never do food again. I don't like that pressure of just the upkeep of food. I don't like maintaining anything. I hardly keep plants. What was I thinking? Trying to do pastries and coffee. You know, that was way beyond who I am as a person. And I learned the other thing too, was I don't really like, um, managing groups of employees. What? You're counting on me to do all your schedule. What? You're counting on me to do your, what? You're sick now. I've got to come in. <laughs> I'm looking back at that. I'm laughing going, I don't know how I didn't see that one coming, but you learn a ton with that. And the third thing I learned was just, I don't want to do a storefront. I, I want to be able to do a human service and work without managing any kind of storefront. That was so profound for opening my next company, which is no food. <laughs> No employees. I hire independent contractors and I have no storefront. I don't yeah. want to manage a facility. That to me was creating so much um, pressure and angst. And it was taking up a ton of my creative energy where I had zero energy. And it's not how I'm wired. Now, some people love that stuff. What was so profound for me is learning, oh my goodness, this is not me. I don't want any of this stuff. So I took those valuable lessons and I pivoted over and created my own coaching company, which now I'm loving. It's been going on for over 15 years. And so I think that's where I'm getting at is that learning lesson about yourself, you know? Yeah. And think about how much better of a coach you are yeah. because of that experience. Exactly. You know, it's these experiences that we, you know, my failures and your failures and your successes, mm -hmm. of course, too, that we bring to our coaching right. that help us help our clients. Like right. I've, I'm, I'm blessed to have had quite a few different experiences in coaching in mm -hmm. big colleges and small colleges and coaching a sport and, and, you know, running multiple different types of businesses. One succeeded and one failed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one was a local home service company and another one was a technology company. Like all this, this breadth of experiences mm -hmm. is what you can bring as a coach 
or, or for, you, for the listeners, if you're not a coach, you know, as, as a mentor, as a guide to people who you're leading and interacting with, these failures are assets for you. Yes. And I love that you keep bringing this up because I really want to normalize it. When I reached out, whether it was coach, counselor, really, I'm going to recommend professional. Because we could lead too hard on our friends and our spouses. And I want to say, give them a break. <laughs> get someone that has professional acumen on how to get back up after a failure or how to push through an obstacle that's been keeping you stuck for too long or how to get your clarity, confidence, courage. Get someone in your life. It accelerates it. I could have dabbled around this for years. But when I brought in a coach in my life, I still want to remember one of the most poignant questions he asked me. He kept saying, Heather, why are you hesitating? I'm like, I don't know, but I don't want to be asked that because it's way too uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> like, leave me alone. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I'm paying for him to not to leave me alone. <laughs> and right. it was such a profound question because I'll ask that of myself even now. And then of course I ask it to my clients. I'll be like, why are you hesitating? And it's beautifully uncomfortable and it's beautifully awkward because no one likes to be called out while they're hesitating, but we get to step into that space and let them know you, you've got your clarity, your confidence. It sounds like you're hesitating. We need to get that courage up. What's going on that's creating this hesitation for you? And being able to identify that because once we can identify it, we can push through. But we have this amazing, phenomenal ability to lie to ourselves or convince ourselves, I'm right. not hesitating. I'm just pondering things. Or I yeah. need to make the perfect list. Or I need to have the perfect things in order. <laughs> yeah. I, I, let me get back to being busy. Or I'm too busy yes. to... To take yes. it. It's not that I don't have the courage or the clarity or the confidence. It's like, no, I'm just, I'm just busy. I got emails to check and yes. busyness to, to go do. Yes. No. And as we do that productive pause, I'm loving that term. Be it, I just want to affirm our listeners, invite someone to that productive pause because those protective pauses for me, if you're anything like me, I'm a huge activist, but I'm like, are you kidding? I don't want to be alone with myself when I don't know what I'm doing. I want to invite someone into that space that says, Here's what it looks like to get back up of a fail, or here's what it looks like to push back through an obstacle, or here's what it looks like to face down those fears that you you but you need help facing down. And more importantly, here's what it looks like to tap in that potential that you know is in you, but you just don't know how to go after it. <laughs> yes. You need somebody outside of your head. Yes. Outside of this, not in the weeds with you. Yes. It can help you get that clarity. Yes. So as we wrap up, Jim, this is a question I love asking everyone. And this is to your point earlier. Isn't it amazing how all truth can kind of find its way? It doesn't matter who's talking or what philosophical construct it is, whether it's psychology or whether it's theology or whether it's performance-based or coaching or whatever. We find a lot of these truths and this productive pause I think we're both zeroing in on it. I mean, we didn't even know each other, but you're saying it, I'm saying it. We're attracted to other leaders and coaches and consultants who are saying it. One of the other things that I have seen that is a uh, line of truth that runs through people who are successful and living successful lives, it's really how they start their day. So out mm -hmm. of my own curiosity, I've just started telling, asking all of my um, guests that are on my podcast what are your morning rituals? How do you start your day? Yes. Great question. I love this. <laughs> my, my morning ritual starts the night before. A successful mm. day starts the night before. And, and for me, it just starts with reducing the, the, the friction to starting my morning, having a, a good quality start to my day. So I, I lay out my workout clothes. I make mm. the coffee. I prep, prep the coffee pot. Um, I even go as far as filling up a glass of water and putting a lid on it, knowing that when I wake up and it's five in the morning and I, I stumble downstairs, yeah. you know, the, I know that my body's dehydrated. I know the first thing I need to put into it is water and mm. it just makes it just a little bit easier. So I'm always looking for little ways to reduce the friction. So starting the night before, and I always tell people that the keystone habit, if there's one habit, if there's one thing you can get right, it's go to bed on time. Because if you do that, you can wake up on time mm -hmm. and and be well rested. Or you, you know, the other option is wake up on time and at the same time and you're not well rested or sleep in and then you mm -hmm. miss your morning routine. But for me, it's always a workout. And then, you know, it's you know, I have four kids, so they're, you know, it's getting them ready for school and out the door. But yeah. it's plan and then it's planning the day, doing mm -hmm. that short productive pause. A productive pause can be, you know. Uh, a weekend. You know, I have a retreat mm -hmm. coming up with my clients and it's a three-day retreat. And 
know, that's a productive pause. But, you know, in the morning I do a short productive pause. What do I need to do to win the day? Like mm. W-I-N, what's important now? What do I need to do to win the day? Identifying that and then be before opening e the email inbox or checking, mm. you know, checking your email, like you have to make that productive pause. Do that short, it might be 30 seconds. It might be a couple minutes at most. How are you going to win the day? So those are those are some of the high level things. And and I'll share actually. I'll mention one more thing that, that Tim Ferriss mentioned is in my interview with him was you know if you look at all the gurus out there and you hear about all these morning routines that people do, if you try to do all of them, you know you're going to yeah. be doing your morning routine until like three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> so you yeah. have to really pick and choose what works for you. Waking up at five a.m. that's not for everybody. Yeah. And you know the things that I do may not work for the next person. And so mm -hmm. every you have to like. Take in all the people that, you know, if you guys are listening to, to Heather's podcast, think about all the different morning routines you've heard other guests share. And then think like, I don't have to do all of those. I don't, yep. in order to be successful, I don't have to do what everybody's doing. Like, mm -hmm. Pick what works for you. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I'm even going to add on to that. You don't even have to do the same thing every morning. If it Agreed. feels like you're, you need, totally agree. I notice I get more tired like Thursday and Friday. So I let myself back off a little bit more. And then I have a total rest day, which is Sunday, which is I try not to check anything or do anything, but having some form of rest, but you get to find that kind of that cadence that allows you to step into that day and really create that framework for you. Love that. And I love the idea of starting the night before I'm going to, I'm actually going to implement that because I find myself, I've got a lot of rituals I do in the morning. I'm like, this is starting to stress me out. I'm like, Whoa, what? just do a couple of these night before and get yourself ready. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, it oh, reduces the friction. It does. Well, Jim, thanks so much for taking the time to just be on there and sharing just what you've learned from your own experiences. And that's really who I like to have on my show. Don't tell me what other people have done or don't tell me what the research says. Tell me how you have actually applied and implemented it because I believe right. that's where it comes from a real authentic space that says this works. You know, this is what I did for me and this is what works. So thanks yeah. for just being fully present and just showing up for us today. Yeah. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I mean, you and I are, we see eye to eye on this stuff and uh, I'm, I'm just grateful to, to share this space with you. Oh, all right. Well, thanks so much. Take care listeners. Thanks, we are cheering you on, aren't we, Jim? Absolutely. <laughs> we'll get it. Thanks for joining us. We had such a great time today. Obviously, we are all stepping into this life that we're made for, but isn't it nice to have a little bit of support along the way? If you want to find out more about the life that you're made for, come find me at heatherpenny.com. Go ahead and subscribe. Give us a review that really helps us out and helps spread the word. You get to step into the life that you're made for. Cheering you on.